students there. Amen? All right, John chapter 16. John chapter 16. This is what the Bible says. These are Jesus, Jesus' words, and uh, Jesus is speaking to his disciples right before his crucifixion. And he says it this way in verse 19. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Someone say a little while. Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again. And you will rejoice. And no one, someone say no one. And no one will take away your joy. How many of y'all believe that's a good promise from Jesus right there? No one will take away your joy. And today, as we are in part four of our vision collection, uh, the word the Lord has given us as we come to the year end, it's always our custom to end the year in expectation so we can start the year in execution. And you see it up on the wall at all the locations today. It's that W8. It's a symbol. But in this symbol, it requires vision to see what the Lord is speaking. We believe that our year end word is that we're to wait on the Lord. Today, I, I wanna preach part four of this collection. I've titled today's talk, It's Worth the Wait. It's Worth the Wait. And I just, I'm gonna need a little bit of help today. And so just look at your neighbor. I'm gonna do this all Sunday long. If you're an introvert, I'm sorry you came to Voo Church today. <laughs> look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. it's worth the wait. It's worth the look at your other neighbor and say, other neighbor. I know you had to wait to talk to me, but it's going to be worth it. <laughs> it's worth the wait. It's worth the wait. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that even in these holiday months, Lord, your house is full of people hungry. Your house is full of people thirsty for your word, thirsty to live the life that you've called us to live. God, I pray today on this historic Sunday at Voo Church, Lord, that you would speak to us. That God, this vision, Lord, that you've given us eight years ago, that today, Lord, many would see it for the first time. Whether they've been on the journey for eight years or it's just their first Sunday, I pray that you would speak to them in a mighty way. Speak to them in a crystal clear way today. We bless your name, Jesus. In Jesus' name, all of God's people said. Come on, all of God's people said. If you love Jesus, every location, can you take about five seconds and give him some... Raise. Come on, Balcony. Help us out. Come on, Design District. Come on, South Miami. Amen, amen, and amen. We have been talking about waiting. And um, I think it begs the question, why does God make us wait? Why does God have us wait? And I just want to try to take you back a little bit. I know we've got lots of different ages in the room, but does anybody remember the epic days of water balloon fights? Who am I talking to? Who am I talking to? If you were born anywhere from 1981, uh, I'm telling you what, water balloon fights was a massive part of my childhood. I, it was, there's something just so incredible about that season of life. I mean, can you, how good was life? That all you had to focus on for about an hour of your time was who I was gonna take this balloon and crush and destroy for the glory of God. I mean, just like, wow, life was good. Life was really good. And if you can go back with me, when I was growing up, I mean, there was a bit of a process, if you will, to a water balloon fight. You couldn't just, you know, I don't know about you, but my mom didn't just have water balloons on hand. We had to go and beg our mom, mom, you know, I've been seeking God. Would you mind heading over and, and getting us some, some water balloons. You had to plan this monumental day. And she would return typically with a bag full of these little, you've seen these before, these, these little water balloons, right? And, and then, then once you got the bag, that, 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 that's, like, that's like a quarter of, of the battle. But then you, you actually had to, had, to, had to call your friends and you had to set a date on the calendar. And you said at this time on this date, there will be a war. <laughs> so you bring your ammo because I already got my ammo. 
Finally, the date arrives, and you go and you get all of your bullets. You get all of your balloons. And it wasn't just, it wasn't very easy, was it? Remember this? Like, you had to, you had to get the balloon, and you had to, like, you know, you had to stretch it out. Some of y'all remember the pain of this, you know? And you had to, you had to fasten it around the mouth of the faucet, you know? And anyone like me, like, I, I think 30% of all the balloons I ever filled up with water always malfunctioned. It was always a casualty of war. I'm bleeding out, you know? Didn't even get to the battle, already died. And then like, you know, you would, you would after you get around the faucet, then, then you would fill it up. Remember this? Like you had to be almost like a neurosurgeon to do this. You'd pull it off the faucet and then your little tiny fingers, you had to tie a little knot like you were like an old grandmother who knows how to sew, you know? I mean, there are people that have become medical doctors all because they went through the pain of water balloon fights. Come on. You finally tie them up. And bro, it just, it, like, it was a journey, man. The idea of 25 water balloons, 25 water balloons, you're living large. F- 50 water balloons? That is like an arsenal that is unmatched, okay? It took a lot of time. We're talking about hours of making water balloons. Finally, the war begins. And if you can remember this, you didn't waste, you didn't waste any of those bullets. You would stalk your prey. You would find them and you would target them and then you would aim and you would throw with passion towards those people. It was amazing, amazing throwing water balloons. And um, and I feel bad for this new generation. I I do because uh, the other day I'm in my backyard and I've got little kids, five-year-old, four-year-old, and two-year-old, and they had some friends over, play date, and um, (laughs) my kids were like, dad, dad, we want to have a water balloon fight. And right away, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> how nostalgic is this? You know, I'm going down memory lane. I mean, I know the world's changed, but some things have remained the same <laughs> until all of a sudden they, they went and they got this uh, con- contraption. <laughs> now, now, some of you are like 20, you know, you have never seen this device. I had never seen it either. Apparently, their mother (laughs) went and purchased this, this thing. They pull this thing out. I go, what on earth is that thing? They take this thing. They run over to the hose. They, I mean, it was so quick. It was disgusting. (laughs) This thing was on in seconds. I'm, I'm down memory lane going, look at the youth of today. They've already fastened it. They turn the hose on within seconds. 25 water balloons are there. And then the part that made me the most angry, they just pull these things off and they're already tied. The devil is a liar. I said, what on earth is this? My kids, within seconds, had 25 water balloons. They pull them off this little thing, and they begin to devour one another. They do this three times in a row. It totaled seven minutes. (laughs) After seven minutes of 850 water balloons, they go, Dad, we're bored. Can we watch a movie? I said, this is bad. (laughs) This is a problem. What are you talking about? People call this an innovation. I call it a tragedy. (laughs) Because if you haven't noticed, we are raising an entire generation that is used to getting things too fast. We are used to getting things too quick. I'm not against getting things fast, and I'm not against things being quick. What I want to remind our church is that speed is a luxury. It is not an entitlement. We look around this world today, and if you think everything in life comes fast, and if you think everything in life is going to be quick, you are going to be sadly disappointed. Because life is a process. There is no getting around that. It takes time. And when I look at people today, I get very, very nervous because there's an entire group of people that are not learning the art of patience. They're not learning how to wait. And it's not that it just isn't helpful towards your development. In many cases, it becomes harmful towards your development. 
I mean, it's no wonder that there's so many people today that are of increased depression like never before. Could it be that many of us were walking through depression because we've lost the art of gratitude? See, waiting produces gratitude. Ask anybody who's waited for something for a long time that they believe for it. On the other side, they're more grateful. I, I can testify to this. My wife and I went on an eight-year journey of infertility. I'm telling you what, when Wyatt Wesley came in January of 2018, you wonder why I'm so passionate about being a dad. It's not just because of the blessing of the son. It's because of the burden of the weight. I'm grateful. There's no wonder why so many people are so discontented in this hour. It's because when you get raised getting everything instantly, you learn the value of nothing. And waiting helps things become more and more clear. Waiting brings understanding. Here's what I know when you get things too quick. When things come too fast, the joy is short-lived. The pleasure is fleeting. How many of y'all know the memories are faint? My kids are not going to remember the day that they threw 800 water balloons. <laughs> but I'm 39 years of age, and I got some core memories of some water balloon fights. Why? Because it took time. It took time. Life takes time. Life is a process. And if you're going to develop into the man of God that he's called you to be or the woman of God that he's called you to be, you're going to have to learn how to embrace the weight. Someone say embrace the weight. You, you got to actually embrace this thing called waiting because something is happening while you're waiting. You're actually living in between the weight. You are actually developing and maturing and growing. God is doing something whether you can see it or not. That's why Isaiah chapter 40 tells us those that wait on the Lord, he will renew their strength. You're going to come out more grateful. You're going to come out understanding the value of something. Please understand. That God does not have hot pocket dreams up in heaven for you. He doesn't have microwave promises for you. If you could really be honest, you don't want God going to the freezer and reheating some plan from the past for your life. No, 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 my friend. Our God is a master chef. Woo! And what he's cooking up is going to take some time because what he has designed for your life is custom. It's authentic. It's tailor-made just for you. He's not using a microwave. He's not using an air fryer. He's got a crock pot. And you're going to have to let that chef marinate that thing for a little while. Someone say embrace the weight. The time, it might be taking more time than you want it to take. It's because it's good. It's because it's great. It's because God has something planned for you. Embrace the weight. James chapter 1 verse 17 says, Every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. What God has for you is good. God is good. And if what God has for you is good and God is good, it means the good thing is going to take some time. And what I can stand up on this stage and testify is that I know what it means to wait on God. I know what it means to put my trust in God. I know what it means to hope in God. And I wanna say it with everything from the inside of my soul to you, wherever you're at and whatever you're facing, it is worth the wait. Come on, can anybody testify that it's worth it waiting on God? Come on, every location, is it worth it to wait on God? Go ahead and make a little bit of noise wherever you're at today. It's worth waiting on God. It's worth it, it's worth it, it's worth it, it's worth it, it's worth it. John chapter 16 is our reading today, and we will get there towards the end of this message. But John chapter 16 uh, really is one isolated text that we pulled out, but it needs to be read in context. And the context of John chapter 16 is really John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. And I would even encourage you to go back and read all of these chapters together, because what you will discover as Jesus is teaching, is Jesus is actually preparing his disciples, watch this, he's preparing his disciples for what he's prepared for them. That's, what, that's, that's, that's the context of all five of those. He's preparing them for what he has prepared for them. 
he, he begins by preparing them for his betrayal and death. Now, how many all know, none of the disciples wanted Jesus to die. That day when Peter was on the seashore and Jesus said, come follow me, he didn't know that three years later that Jesus would be betrayed and that it was gonna be outlawed to follow him and that following him was gonna mean his death. He didn't know that at the moment. So now when Jesus begins to describe his betrayal and death, these guys are afraid to say the least. But right there, we get a blues clues of what Jesus is teaching you and I, that as we go through life, there will be difficult and scary days, watch this, that are designed by God. And these days, many times, are not to break you, but in actuality, they're there to bless you, to benefit you. You better be careful, man of God. You better be careful, woman of God, that every bit of opposition that you're in right now, not all of the suffering that you are facing right now is punishment from God. Some of the suffering that you're walking through right this moment is not punishment, it's preparation. God's preparing you. God's fine-tuning you. God's getting you ready. Jesus is, is teaching about his betrayal and death, and then he begins to teach about his resurrection. Not only does he teach about his resurrection, he teaches us about our resurrection. This is what I love about Jesus because in teaching them about their resurrection, he's actually preparing them to endure the suffering of this world. And how does he choose to do that? He begins to paint a picture of a future to come. He begins to instill them with vision. What's the vision that Jesus chooses? John chapter 14, look at this. You've heard it before. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. So if you're here today, and you're afraid, and you're scared, and you're confused, or you've got something that's got you worried, or you're anxious about something, and you're a follower of Jesus, that's really important. This isn't some self-help talk. This isn't like a TED Talk, positive motion, like, oh, wow, yeah, don't be troubled, just happy days. That, that's not what I'm saying. If you're following Jesus, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Everything about Christianity is about belief. It's not about doing, it's about believing. Doing comes from believing. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare, there it is, a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. So so what does Jesus do to prepare them? He prepares them by giving them, watch this, a vision of heaven. Why? Because vision gives pain purpose. And if I know where I'm headed and if I know where I'm going, I can endure the suffering of the moment. You gotta see this because the mission to evangelize the world is fueled by the vision of heaven. This isn't like a new thing. This is how the story goes, that Jesus gave us a great commission. As a church, we're not looking for a mission. No, the mission has a church. And the mission is to go and evangelize. The mission is to go and see lost people found. The mission is to bring people that are far from God, close to God, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Anybody on board with the mission of Jesus? Go ahead and make a little bit of noise today. There is a mission. But if we're being honest, we get weary in the mission. And Jesus is not just the Son of God. He happens to be the greatest leader ever. So if you're an employer, if you're a mother, if you're a father, if you're a leader of any sense, notice what he does. He doesn't just give them a mission, he gives them a vision. Because the vision fuels the mission. And the vision he always wants to bring us back to is the eternal. I don't know what's gonna happen to you in this life. I cannot promise you that there won't be more difficult days. I cannot promise you that you won't face really hard times. What I can promise you is that if you are in Christ Jesus, he promises that he will be with you every step of the way and he's got a room prepared for you and it is called heaven. I know, I know, I know, but I wonder, is there anybody who's happy about heaven? Is there anybody who can just shout for a moment that when this life is over, I'm I'm going to a place where there will be no more tears, there will be no more pain. I'm living for heaven. Heaven, 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 heaven. Heaven is the vision. It's amazing because I think in 2023, we get so caught up in the here and now that we lose sight of what the early believers, how they suffered, how they sacrificed, what they went through to move this gospel forward. It wasn't black leather jackets and Britney Spears microphones. It was men and women who suffered and died. And how did they find the strength? Oh, 
they were prepared by Jesus, by him telling us what he's prepared for us. He's trying to say, when you get to heaven, it's going to be worth it. I don't know if I should give him the bricklayer's offering. Let me tell you what, God has not designed for you to go broke by giving to him. When you step into eternity, it's not going to be like, oh my God, oh my God, I gave so much. I don't know what that voice is or who that person is. Sorry. You know what I really regret at the end of my life? I served way too much. I just served way, I just, I just helped people too much. I was at too many, I love my cities. Ha, ah, crazy. Why'd I go to so many? It won't happen. When you get to heaven and you see the room he prepared for you, you're gonna say, it was worth it. 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 But Jesus, he doesn't just prepare them for his death and he doesn't just prepare them for his resurrection. He prepares them for his return. He's coming back. He's coming back for his church is what Revelation says. He's coming back for his bride. Not coming back for a show, not coming back for a production, not coming back for a talk, not coming back for a sermon, coming back for his people. And the way that he chooses to prepare them with the suffering that they might endure is he uses this phrase, and you gotta go back and you gotta see it, but it's used many different times. He uses regarding his death, he uses regarding his resurrection, he, re he uses it regarding his return, he uses this little phrase, a little while. A little while. In a little while, you won't see me. In a little while, you will see me. In a little while, I'll be with you. In a little while, I will return for you. Now, you know, look, I'm just a guy. Um, but have you ever noticed, like, I don't really know what Jesus means when he says a little while. Like, I don't know if we got the same definition for a little while. I know my wife and I, we struggle with this too. Because my wife, if we're getting ready, I've had to learn after 17 years of marriage that if we're getting ready to go out to a party, if I say, babe, are you ready to go? And she says, give me a little while. I've learned I can put a full movie on. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a hurting man right there. Um, I've learned we got different definitions of a little while. But like for me, a little while, I don't know, an hour, two hours. But it seems like with Jesus, a little while really means a long while. Yeah. Jesus, I think what you meant to say is a long while. A little while or long while? Well, it's important that you read the entire Bible in its context because all of a sudden you flip over to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, and Peter had a revelation. Peter said, but do not forget this one thing. Someone say, don't forget this one thing. Dear friends, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years is like a day. Oh, Jesus, you could have told me that when you said a little while. Because honestly, he died, and for a little while, he was gone, three days. And they saw him again, and for a little while, he walked with them, 50 days. And then he ascended to heaven, and he says, I'm coming back for you. But the little while has turned into 2,000 years. But is it 2,000 years, or is it two days? Trying to help somebody. The late president, John F. Kennedy, he said it this way. He said, we must use time as a tool, not as a couch. Time is a tool. God uses time as a tool, as a tool, as a tool. And we are waiting for his return. We are waiting and we are longing for his return. But I want to encourage you. You got to learn to live in the wait. You gotta live while you wait. I don't know what a little while means. Is it three days, 50 days, 2,000 years? I don't really know. All I know is that Jesus said a little while and I'm gonna bank on that promise that he is coming back for his church and I'm gonna worship and live in the wait. You only get a little while to live. James, the brother of Jesus, says, our life is but a vapor. Our life is but a mist. I know you're real healthy. You've been eating your green broccoli. You do CrossFit and Orange Theory and F45. But yo, if you get 90 years, what is 90 years in comparison to eternity? 
I'd call that a little while. So if you only get a little while to live, you better learn to live a little. I know that expression gets used by a lot of people to say, let's live reckless, let's live debaucherous, let's just have a crazy night. But I think in the body of Christ, we need to reclaim that expression and we need to understand I'm living my life not by default, but by design. I'm not living on accident. I'm living on purpose. I'm not going to waste time. I'm going to wait on God. I'm going to live a little. Come on. Anybody feel like living a little in the little time we got? Live a little. Live a little, live a little, live a little. Jesus says, wait a while. I'm coming back, wait a while. So if you're hurting today, wait a while. If you're afraid today, wait a while. If you're confused, wait a while. If you're broken, wait a while. If you need a miracle, wait a while. If you don't know what tomorrow is gonna look like, wait a while. Because he says you're going to live a little while, so you might as wait a while, because he promises to make it worth our while. It's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be worth it. 1998, my family moved from Tacoma, Washington to Miami, Florida. I was 14 years of age. I had met the Lord in a deep way in seventh grade. I felt a call from God at an early age. I was in a revival in the seventh grade. Moved to Miami in my ninth grade year and somewhere in that high school journey. Never stopped believing in God, but definitely was, was running from God. In December of 2001, I believe it was, I was in Australia with my dad and I was in a service and I had an encounter with the Lord and I heard God speak to me. He said, Rich, how long are you going to run from your calling? And I made a conscious decision right there at 17 years of age that I was going to serve God wholeheartedly. Doesn't mean I never made a mistake again. Doesn't mean I didn't fall again. It just means I was passionate. I wanted to see God move in my generation. As faith would have it, in February of 2002, I was in Nashville, Tennessee, and I met Don Cherie. Didn't know it at the time, but I was meeting my wife. Now, I wanted her to be my wife, but she had no word from God for a long time. <laughs> Time. Went to school in Cleveland, Tennessee. Eventually, Don Cherie joined me my freshman year of Bible college. I started a Bible study. That's when you know you're in trouble when you're at a Bible college and you got to start Bible studies. <laughs> but man, we started to see it grow. Close to 60 people showing up on Thursday nights, and I was preaching. Didn't know what I was doing that summer. Got a little minivan and a trailer. Had a little worship group called Broken, and we went all up and down the East Coast preaching in youth group after youth group. My message was from the story of Elijah and prophets of Baal, and my message was titled Sold Out and Radical. I wanted to see a generation touched by God. We were married in Bible college, and um, we were coming towards our, our last year and our senior year. We were 22 and 21, and we came to visit my parents in Miami Gardens, where they were pastoring a church called Trinity Church. And... Um, as we were there on that trip, the Lord just began to speak to me. And it wasn't that I had this beautiful vision and I didn't see all of this. Uh, in fact, we left Christmas and we had some job offers from some different larger churches. And I just said to my wife, I said, babe, I just feel like I'm called to go and serve my parents for the next five years. It wasn't crystal clear. It wasn't this big. It was just, I, I'm just supposed to go and align myself and sit under them and serve them and be a blessing to them and be a good son. My wife, who's the greatest Christian I've ever met, she said, I'm with you, heart and soul. I talked to my dad around March of 2007, and he said, Rich, what's the Lord put on your heart? I said, Dad, we're gonna come back to Miami, we're gonna serve you, he said, what do you wanna do? I said, I feel like the Lord's speaking to me that we're to start a young adult movement called the Rendezvous. The Lord had given me that word, Rendezvous, it's the meeting place uh, based out of Ecclesiastes that says, pity a man who falls and has no one to pick him up. And we said, let's build a place that people could meet one another, but they could also connect with God. And we moved back in May of 2007, and that summer, we started to cast vision. In September of 2007, we launched this, this Tuesday night service, and it was pretty bad for a solid two years. Not many people came. We were finding ourselves as leaders and as ministers. We're still on that journey. Thank you for your grace. But uh, about two years into it, something began to break. Something began to open up. And before you know it, that group of 200 people turned into 1,200 people on a Tuesday night. People from Broward County and from South Beach all coming into this area to meet and encounter God. My 
I remember very, very vividly because after eight years of serving my parents, eight is the number of new beginnings, and it seems like God continues to do significant things in my life every eight years. But after eight years of serving, we sensed a new beginning, and it was that church that planted us and sent us out as an autonomous church, and I felt a burden to launch in the city of Miami. We started in the rescue mission. From the rescue mission, some of you were on that journey with us as we went to Jose de Diego Middle School in Wynwood. It quickly began to grow, and it was bigger than what we could anticipate. Six different services. Uh, I was preaching every one of them live. Uh, somehow, by the grace of God, we found this building that I'm preaching in right now, the iTech Auditorium. We went to two locations, and just God began to bless it. God began to show up in a mighty, mighty way. The pandemic hit, and with it, we, all of our services were in, in public schools, and so we had no place to gather, and our church of thousands all of a sudden became an online stream service, but somehow, as faith would have it, our God, not with us looking, not for us searching, but for us waiting on him. He didn't just bring one property, but he brought us two properties. We purchased the Design District Building and South Miami. I'm gonna be honest with you. I had never been to South Miami in my life. I didn't know where that was. I didn't know what that was. I think I went to UM a couple times, but I didn't know what South Miami was. And I sort of went there with my legs shaking, going, I don't even know if this is God, but this is the only open door we've got right now. And quickly, once again, that place went to five services and began to explode. Somehow, as faith would have it, we were able to get back into this facility. And now today, we find ourselves in three different locations, close to 6,000 people every Sunday showing up and encountering Jesus. And so it brings me today to, I think, what we've been calling our biggest miracle yet. But like all miracles, they don't just come always in clear form blessing. Many times they come wrapped and disguised in burdens. And many times you can be holding on to one miracle, but in the very same breath, in need of another miracle. And so what do you do in a little while? You wait on him, and you trust in him, and you believe that he has a plan and a purpose because eight years later, we are now 16 years in the city of Miami serving this place, and God spoke to me that it wasn't just a season of new beginnings, but it was a season of a fresh start. I didn't know at the time what that meant as I announced that phrase to our staff this past summer, but as faith would have it, I now know today exactly why the Lord spoke that to us. Why don't you check out the screens? In 1998, Dr. Rich and Robin Wilkerson moved across the country from Tacoma, Washington to lead Trinity Church in Miami. For the past 25 years, their faithfulness has made a profound impact on the city of Miami and people around the world. In 2015, after eight years of serving Trinity Church and leading the Rendezvous Young Adult Service, Rich and I planted VU Church. On Sunday, November 26th, both leadership teams from VU and Trinity came together for an important update on Pastor Rich Sr.'s health and the future of both churches. Many of you are aware of my personal battle with polycythemia rubra vera, a condition by the grace of God that we've been managing since our move from Washington to here in 1998. A few months ago, doctors informed us that this disease has morphed into what is known as myelofibrosis, a form of bone marrow cancer. And my spirit remains unshaken. I've never felt stronger in my faith more confident in God's healing power and more committed to the work he has set before us. In the coming months, my focus will shift as I undergo medical treatment. I will move into what we are calling a medical sabbatical. I'm not resigning, no, I'm not retiring. Instead, I am stepping into a season of healing fully believing in God's promise of a complete recovery. Hallelujah. Our faith and our prayers are with Pastor Rich Sr., Pastor Robin, and our entire Wilkerson family. And while we pray for a miracle in his body, as a church, 
God is leading us to expand our trust in the wait. We believe that answering the generational call to Miami Gardens is the next step in our miracle journey. As we step forward in faith, Trinity and VU have come to an agreement to move into a new season for both churches. VU Church is purchasing Trinity's current location in Miami Gardens, a nine acre lot with a 100,000 square foot facility where Trinity has gathered since 2004. This plan also enables Trinity Church to renovate, remodel, and relocate to their original property in North Miami. Our fourth location, VU Miami Gardens, will launch in January 2024, expanding VU Church to the Miami Gardens community, a home that is very dear to us. I really believe that God has divinely aligned at this moment in history and in time. And I declare out loud that no eye has seen and no ear has heard what God is in store for Miami Gardens. I'm telling you what, we're going to see many come to know Jesus. We're going to see a city turned upside down, and we're going to see the gospel move forward, lives changed, lives transformed. We have not started this, and we won't finish it. We'll be faithful for our part, as God is the builder and sustainer of all. As we believe for Pastor Rich Sr.'s complete healing, we are confidently answering the call to continue the legacy of faith in Miami Gardens. And we believe this will be the greatest miracle season yet. And the famous line, we love to see it on a regular basis, the best is yet to come. always said that we are um, a miracle in motion. Um, we've been saying that phrase, the, the greatest miracle yet, and um, the other day it kind of felt like, I don't think that's the right phrasing to everybody. My dad's really sick and he needs a real miracle. But then I, I, I caught myself because it's actually the right phrase. So on one hand, the body known as Boo Church is expanding, could have never picked this timing, would have never strived for this, wanted this. It's God. We sense his call on us. But on the other hand, my dad's body needs a miracle. And so on one hand, it's the greatest miracle yet. But on the other hand, in faith, this is who we are. From the valley of the shadow of death, we speak faith. And we believe we're going to see him healed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so it's our greatest miracle season yet. Yet. That's the word you got to hang on to sometimes. That's the word you got to cling to sometimes. Maybe you're not healed yet. Maybe you're not free But it's a little while. It's just a little while. God is cooking something and God is preparing something and he's inviting you and I in to step out in faith. And I close with our text because the analogy that Jesus tells is so fitting and so perfect. He talks about a woman in labor. He talks about a woman giving birth. Now, I've never been in labor. I'm a man. <laughs> And I know culture is confused, but only girls <laughs> can have babies. I don't even, I'm not, I'm gonna get, y'all gonna cancel me on a historic Sunday. I'm just, that's not even the topic. I'm just saying, I was more trying to say to all the ladies, I don't, I never, you know, you get it. Never been in labor. But I have been pregnant with vision. And I know, I know what it's like to give birth birth to something that God's put into my heart. I know it from a young age. I know that when I close my eyes, I see more, not for our glory, but for his. Don Shree said it so perfectly. We didn't start this. We will not finish it if Jesus 
doesn't return in my lifetime. We are not the heroes of any story. We have one job, and that is to be faithful to the moment. I don't know how God has orchestrated this, but the fact that we are gonna own properties in North Miami all the way to South Miami, I don't know if there has ever been a better angle and a better opportunity in the city of Miami than what Boo Church is being given right now. Jesus, he says, a woman, that when she's in labor, she's in pain. But isn't it funny, my friends, they're probably in the service right here, they go, to the, they go to the city. They call me this week in the midst of all this and said, Rich, we're pregnant, we're pregnant. We've been praying and we've been believing for this miracle. And how many of y'all know, when they told me this news, I didn't say, oh man, whew, labor. <laughs> you guys sure? You guys sure you ready for that? Ooh, labor, that's a bummer. No, everybody knows that labor is a part of the process. But once you give birth and you're holding on to that baby, you forget about the pain of what it costs you to breathe and push. And I've seen God do great things in 16 years. I've seen God whisper things to my spirit. And I've seen as we've endured and I've seen him bring them to fruition. And every one of them, I say it's worth it. I don't know a lot about labor, but I know this, that when you're in labor, there's two things you gotta do. You gotta breathe and you gotta push. And I don't know what you're pregnant with today, but I always say, keep on breathing. <laughs> Some of you this week, <laughs> get to that job. <laughs> Dealing with that boss. You know what your marriage needs? Those kids. You don't stop breathing. And you don't stop pushing. I grew up in old church. And so in old church, we had acronyms for everything. And the acronym I grew up with, with push, is you pray until something happens. I'm going to breathe. I'm going to trust God, and I'm going to pray until something happens. You say, Rich, are you scared for your dad? I think there's feelings, there's emotions. Well, what are we going to do? I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to wait on God. And if I know anything about God, it might not happen when I want it to happen. And that might not happen the way I want it to happen. Ooh, but let me testify, it is always better than how I could have ever planned. But we don't wait. I'm just breathing, you know? I'm just pushing. Miracles in the house. Miracles at Design District. The miracles online. Someone's watching this right now. Some other place. The miracles there. We're gonna wait on God. He's gonna make the miracle come to pass with my dad, with our church. Keep breathing, keep pushing, don't give up. Because when you're hanging on to your miracle, you're gonna hold that thing in your hand and you too will testify to everyone around you, it was worth the wait. Come on, the miracle is worth the wait. Come on, somebody. The promise is worth the wait. God's plan is worth the wait. Come on, do you believe that God's help? is worth the wait. Come on, do you believe God's deliverance is worth the wait? God's provision is worth the wait. Can anybody testify? It's worth waiting on God. If you 